Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Tom Malarkey. I'm a partner at SW. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to our Spotlight Wine Export Diversification webinar today. Firstly, I want to acknowledge the traditional custodians and their connection to land, sea and community, and we pay respect to their elders past, present and emerging. We have a great panel for you today. We're very excited to be able to bring together these leading experts on their respective Asian markets. We are joined by Stuart, Makoto, Sangmi, Sneha and Mark to discuss the export potential and practicality for Australian wine in these markets. Now, before we get going, there are a couple of housekeeping matters to attend to. We recommend that you click on the enter full screen button in the top right corner of your screen. That's to achieve the best webinar experience. Uh, we will be running a Q&A function today. So if you would like to ask or submit a question, please hit the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and submit it there. We'll endeavor to answer your questions at the end of the presentation, or otherwise we are happy to contact you when the session is over. Finally, we are running some polling questions today. Uh, two questions which should be popping up on your screen about now. As soon as you answer those questions, that screen will disappear, but the questions are accessible throughout the seminar through the poll function button. Again, it's at the bottom of your screen, and I'll share the results of that, those questions towards the end of the session. So with the housekeeping done, I'd like to introduce Marco Callahan, Managing Director of Wine Network Consulting. He will be moderating today's session. Mark joined that company as a director and consultant in 2013 after working as a senior winemaker for one of the largest Australian wine companies. He works with wine businesses across Australia and around the world, including China and England, with area projects in India and the Canary Islands. Mark is on the management committee and is the immediate past president of the Yarra Valley Wine Growers Association. He is a regular wine show judge, occasional author and lecturer, member of the Victorian Pinot Noir Workshop Committee and former chair of the Committee for the Yarra Valley Wine Show and James Halliday Chardonnay Challenge. He's also a scholar uh, at the 2007 Lynn Evans Tutorial, so a very busy man. Welcome, Mark. We're excited to be presenting this webinar with you today on such an, an important topic. Over to you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, in terms of the sequence, we've got our four speakers presenting for us today, followed by a Q&A session. Um, it's a formidable lineup and there's some really interesting content coming. Um, our first speaker joining us from Sydney is Stuart Barclay from Wine Australia, uh, General Manager of Marketing, uh, and he'll provide some opening remarks. Stuart joined Wine Australia in 2014 as General Manager marketing. He has responsibility for Wine Australia promotional activities domestically and internationally. He has more than 23 years experience in the wine sector in the UK and Australia, including 10 years experience managing buying, wine production, direct to consumer sales, and marketing channels for the Cell Masters Group and Woolworths Liquor. Thank you for joining us, Stuart. Over to you. Thank you, Mark. Um, it's great to be here, everyone, to uh, talk about diversification. Um, I just want to set the scene. Um, many of you would have seen some of this before, but I think it, it just puts a bit of reality into perspective. COVID-19 isn't going to go away. Uh, global vaccine rollouts are uh, uh, delayed, deferred, uh, challenged around the world. Some markets have got good rollouts, some don't. Uh, trade expos are no longer viable in many respects. So the provines and the been expos of this world uh, shutter from being um, open to, to being postponed. Uh, closure of the Chinese market has had a significant impact on Australia, 123 million litres of wine available. Um, weekend on-premise demand globally, uh, restaurants and bars have been closed. Consumers are drinking less, but they're trading up. We have ongoing travel restrictions. Global supply chains have impacted. Containers are in the wrong spots. Shipping delays, port strikes. And then you've got the dominance of uh, the retail uh, e-commerce channels and that digitization of the world. We're all doing Zoom webinars every week now. So the world is very different. Uh, sorry, one of my slides have stuck. Um, so what is Wine Australia's current priorities? Obviously, um, finding homes for 123 million litres of wine, but 
Our key markets historically, and, and they still are because we have offices there, are the USA. Key focus on California, Texas, Florida, Illinois, New Jersey, and New York. Canada, uh, British Columbia, uh, Quebec, and Ontario. The UK, we operate out of the High Commission in London. We focus very much on the Nordics, Germany, and Netherlands. Then in Asia, we've never really had a strong footprint. We closed our office in Tokyo down in 2011. But um, our key markets there, which we've identified working very, very closely with Austrade is, is Vietnam, Indonesia, Thailand, South Korea, Taiwan, and Japan. Now, as part of that working with Austrade, I thought it really important to update you in terms of what's happening. Um, Austrade received a funding boost back in December 2000, uh, 2020. Um, the team announced about $72 million worth of additional funding to put extra boots on the ground in the markets. Those extra boots are basically BDMs in the posts. There's a series and suite of global engagement managers uh, being employed, really to drive additional opportunities for the 13 agri-commodities impacted by China. Now, One Australia and Austrade are very much working together in partnership. Uh, they're investing heavily in the uh, Connect um, program with One Australia across the different markets. They're supporting extra activity into the market entry programs in the USA. Um, in Canada as well, there's language support for translations of, of the Australian Wine Discovered educational modules, which is a really important piece for exporters to understand. And there's extra support for doing more virtual tastings across the Asian markets as well. Now, some of you would have seen this in the last few days. These are our latest export results. Um, sales have dropped by 10% to 2.56 billion. That is driven by the Chinese downturn. But we are seeing growth in other markets. Certainly, South Korea is a standout of 111% up, but it is a smaller market. The UK is really driving the, the demand at the moment, and we've seen an upswell of 26% extra volumes going into the UK and, and value as well. The US has, uh, is, is slightly down at the moment, but there is positivity in the export numbers, but there, there is no silver lining to the Chinese issue. Now, this particular webinar is all about Asia in many respects. And um, what I have here in this particular slide is just an update in terms of what are our nine um, largest markets across the Asian market. That's basically 47 million cases valued at uh, total um, of market of 47 million cases valued at $6.1 billion. Of that, Japan is by far the biggest wine market. As mentioned, South Korea is close to a billion dollars and we're seeing very good growth there, but it's off a relatively small base. A lot of the other markets are relatively small, less than $500 million in total. They're geographically fragmented markets. Some markets such as Singapore are trading hubs. What goes into that market doesn't necessarily get consumed or sold there. And across the entire Asian markets, there's significant market access issues, regulatory um, uh, issues, tariff issues, and social attitudes to alcohol different, differ from market to market. Now, these are the high level market trends. Um, COVID-19 has interrupted value growth across the region in 2020. In 2021, subject to COVID surges, we had expected the region to be relatively stable. Uh, we've done forecasts out in the region to 2025. And over that period of time, we do expect some volume increases to play through of about 2% per annum, with value increases of also about 3% annually coming through as well. But we are forecasting that all markets will grow. Uh, but what we're seeing is that some of the strongest growth rates are in the smaller markets. And I'll get to that a little bit later. But what I also mentioned is that per capita consumption around the world is dropping. Um, and it also, across the Asian markets, it's low anyway. So per capita consumption of wine is low across the region. It varies from 2.4 litres in Japan down to 0.01 litres in India. Wine is not the first choice for the consumer in this market, and we have to recognise that. Beer, spirits all, all perform, outperform wine. Non-consumption of alcohol is also very, very normal in this region. Per capita consumption is on the rise in South Korea, has declined in Japan and Taiwan, and has been relatively stable in the other markets. Price points. As you can see from this slide, the biggest price point uh, variance is in Singapore, where there is a higher preference of more premium wines. 
almost three quarters of all wines sold in the region is commercial value table wine. So it's less than $10 US per bottle with a quarter of that premium and above. Singapore has the highest share of premium sales and Indonesia and India the lowest. South Korea and Japan have very similar price point profiles. Now here's some price point trends. Uh, commercial value growth is forecast to be stronger overall across the regions. Uh, for the premium segments, South Korea, Thailand, Vietnam, India and Indonesia are the standout countries for potential growth. Japan is expected slowly to grow post COVID. And as you can see from the five year K guys, um, there is variability across the different markets. Australian market share in the regions. Well, um, Australia has a small share of wine across the Asian markets. So our volume is about 7% and our value about 10%. Australia is, however, the market leader in India, Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, and Singapore. There has been significant upside for Australia in Japan, South Korea, Vietnam, and Taiwan in the short to medium term. Whilst Australia is the market leader in India for tea imported table wine, the market will be a slow burn until a free trade agreement or market access issues are resolved. So whilst we have identified six target markets in the short term, India is very much the slow burn market and there's a lot more government support to be able to open the markets up. Australian wine exports into the region. Well, the, the, the top nine markets account for about 5% of the volume and 10% of the value for Australian wine exports. Japan is the biggest by volume, but has the lowest average value amongst the top nine markets due to a large proportion of unpackaged bulk wine in the mix. We do have a free trade agreement, but also so does Chile. Chilean wine is extremely price competitive and Australia really struggles to compete. The Olympics hasn't generated demand due to restrictions and importers are sitting on high inventory levels. Also consumption in Japan has dropped during COVID, whereas in other markets, we've seen some increases. And as I said already, India is, has significantly regulatory challenges, but high tariffs and also we see it as a slow burn market. The total value of exports to the nine markets increased by 21% in 2021. Well, value has also grown over the last five years to 8% per annum. South Korea, as already mentioned, is a standout with growth of 111% in 2021. With the exceptions of Malaysia and Vietnam, all markets showed growth in the previous five years pre-COVID. But at the moment, all markets are suffering. The COVID surge, on-premises are closed, ongoing restrictions and lockdowns are in place. And we're seeing consumption in certain markets drop. A lot of exporters impacted by China are also targeting similar markets and there is saturation occurring. Um, Austrade in particular is seeing a lot of individuals, a lot of companies wanting to target South Korea, but there is only a certain amount of pipeline uh, feel we can undertake in these markets. However, there are opportunities out there for every exporter, subject to the price point they want to play in. Now, one of the areas that we've been developing over the last 18 months to support exporters looking for new market opportunities is the launch of the Australian Wine Connect platform, which we launched back in April, 2021. The Connect platform is being designed to be a 24 seven always on 12 month expo. It is designed to, for exporters to identify target markets and what we are doing with uh, One Australia, but also with Austrade, is targeting those markets to drive high quality buyer traffic onto the platform to do a buyer and seller connection point. A buyer can search by price point, they can search by FFOB value, they can search by region, they can search by style. So it gives um, the buyer a great opportunity or a great resource to be able to target exporters to drive that growth. As I mentioned, why connect? Well, expos aren't really viable in the short term. Yes, there's, there are plans by Vinexpo and Provine to um, have trade shows over the next 12 months. Will they actually go ahead? A lot of changes are being accelerated by the pandemic. Consumer patterns have also been altered. So consumers are buying in a different way. There is a lot of online e-commerce happening now. Some markets you can't do e-commerce, such as South Korea. Currently, the uh, Connect platform has about 290 expo booths, over 3,000 products, and we're seeing about 80 to 100 pure buyer connections happening per month. Our aim is to get the platform to over 500 wineries exporters in the next two months, and we're working with Oztrade to be able to undertake that activity. 
But there is no silver lining out there. Every market is different. You have to be committed to do export. There are lots of challenges from regulatory issues to con consumers all purchasing wine in a different way. Inventory levels across the region are high. Uh, the Olympics hasn't driven consumption in Japan, for example. Lockdowns continually to play through on a day-to-day -day basis and COVID is surging. So the world's a very different place to where we, what we've been used to over the last few years. And um, Wine Australia is here to help, so is Austrade. So please, uh, please contact us if you need support and extra help. And uh, I look forward to talking to you in the, in the future. Um, here's just a reminder, is if you're interested in, in Australian Wine Connect, connect.australianwine.com uh, will take you to the portal where you can sign up. Thank you, Mark. Brilliant. Thanks, Stuart. That was absolutely fascinating. Some really sobering material in there. Um, so now <clears throat> we'll move seamlessly from Sydney across to Sapporo in Japan, where our second speaker is Makoto Shimizu. Um, she will... Uh, she's a consultant at Hokkaido Strategic Trade and Investment Promotional Services. She will give us an overview of Japan. Uh, as a marketing consultant based in Hokkaido, Japan, assisting Japanese and overseas businesses with their international expansion plans, Makoto works as a business development manager in the food and agribusiness sector at Austrade Sapporo office for 17 years. And she's worked at Jetro as assisting overseas companies in their investment projects into Japan. Uh, welcome, Makoto. Thanks for joining us and over to you. Uh, thank you, Mark. Um, uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk, talk about the Japanese market. I have recent, recently assisted state government export program and I have spoken with a number of Japanese wine importers earlier this month. So I'm happy to share the, um, the responses as well as the market overview with you. I will not spend much time about the data, but just to show you the economic snapshot and the minimum wage um, in Japan is quite low compared to Australia. This slide shows how small of the wine market in Japan. Uh, wine market share is slightly increasing year by year, but it's still small, very small. The green one is the wine. Uh, liquor is expanding its share in the alcohol market. In a small pie of, ma of ma wine market, Australian wine share is also small. Due to COVID, I have not participated or have not seen such a scene for a long time, uh, but I would say more than 90% of Japanese groups order unlimited drinking system at the restaurants. Probably um, Japanese people do not drink much alcohol compared to Australian people, um, but it's very simple and a great system. Japanese people respect harmony and avoiding open conflict all the time, and people do not want to waste the time before making a toast. So people often start with beer in this kind of situation, which is called a toriaizu beer, or beer to start with. This unlimited drink system includes all kinds of alcohol, um, but the quality of wine is not good for many restaurants, especially at Japanese izakaya type of restaurants. The image of Australian wine uh, for consumer is generally good, uh, probably thanks to Aussie beef. Uh, Japanese consumers think um, Australia is one of the safest country to source food and drinks. Um, <clears throat> generally, not many consumer drink wines with the knowledge in Japan but the wine specialists or sommeliers are quite educated in Japan. There are more than 75,000 qualified sommeliers in Japan. And the Sommelier Association says more than 4,000 people uh, passed the sommelier qualifications exam last year. And the success rate was less than 40%. So more than 10,000 people tried to be a sommelier last year. So consumer needs, to true, uh, consumer needs to rely on the sommelier's advice to choose the wine at the restaurants. So Australian wine is easy to go with food at re reasonable price, and many of them are soft tanning. So it can be recommended for wine beginners at the restaurants. And I have, I ha I have heard of the expectation, ex expectations uh, for Australian wines by sommeliers. Are circled in blue. 
So they have to deal with the hundreds of wines every day. So they would like to find something new, something different, something unique, uh, something special. So trends under the COVID situation, people need to stay at home and the food delivery is expanding. And you, you may see um, um, this kind of delivery robots where you come to Japan next. So wines at retail shops are sold well, but many Australian boutique wines are sold by food services at the restaurants. So quite a lot of small and medium sized importers said um, food imports Australian boutique wines said they are not in a position to purchase new wines until the food service sector is revitalized. So photos in the left bottom is um, variety of lemon sour, um, liquor based cocktail, which is very popular at the moment. So I'm sure many of you know how we both um, exchange business cards and maintain, maintaining our politeness all the time. So I just would like to raise the image of the tradition and the history for Japanese. So I'm sure many of Australian wineries respect uh, the, your traditions or history of the wineries, but our history in Japan has longer than that. So many of sake breweries have more than you know, 300, year, 300 years history and third generation for us does not mean much. So Japanese people respect relationship more than the detail of the deal as shown. I also like to uh, like you to understand our slow decision making process in Japan. So it takes so long and too many people are involved in the process. So I'd like to advise you to be patient and develop a relationship um, during the patience. So Japanese people will give you uh, lots of questions about wine wineries and um, you know maybe wine making method and um, so, so many questions you you will receive from the Japanese importers. Um, I have heard that some some importers say the demand for the reasonable priced orange wines or skin contact natural wine is increasing here, like the global trends. So I'm sure Australian has the capability and flexibility to produce those wines. So those wines are also easy to differentiate from other countries' wines. But I also like to mention to work closely with Japanese importers. A French winery is working with a Japanese importer and they are uh, using Japanese barrel to produce uh, special wines for Japan in France and which is well accepted in the market. So number of wineries in Japan is incre rapidly increasing. And I'm sure there are a lot of people who is interested in working with Australian wineries to leverage and counter season advantages to produce wines together. So our decision making process respects you know, the relationship, you see. So this is a data of a wine Australia and the value of Australian wine import is increasing, which means the Japanese importer is purchasing more expensive wine than before. So I'm sure the value curve can be bigger and bigger. So I'm more than happy to support for that, um, support an Australian wine industry um, if I can at the, any time in the future. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thanks, Makoto. Some <clears throat> tremendous advice in there. That was yeah, some brilliant insights there. Um, now, one little housekeeping matter that we might go to is just maybe to remind the delegates to keep in mind the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. So if you have questions during the, during the session, you can shoot those through and we'll corral those near the end to make that nice and nice and focused. So just popping over the uh, over the straits or over the sea there, we'll go from Japan over to Korea now. And in Seoul, we have Sangmi Kim joining us. Um, she will give us an overview of the wine market in South Korea. Um, she's a leading writer and educator in the field of wine. She's Sangmi is currently writing for wine21.com, the leading on wine portal. And I hope I have the pronunciation right here. Economy Chosun 
one of the most famous weekly news media outlets in Korea. She also previously wrote weekly wine columns for Dong uh, Weekly, one of the top three news magazines in Korea. Uh, she also teaches WSET courses and teaches wine in universities. Leading expert, she's been recognized through her appointment as a judge at the Berlin Wine Trophy, Asia Wine Trophy and Korea Wine and Spirits Awards. She works as an interpreter and a panelist for various wine conferences such as Gambero Rosso, and one seminars for California, Argentina, Spain, and Greece. Thank you and welcome, Sangmi, over to you. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. So, okay. Uh, in Korea, the local wine production is very small. So almost all wine consumed is imported. Uh, since 1996, the wine import has steadily increased but last year, Korea recorded the biggest wine import reaching 330 million US dollars, which is 27% uh, up compared to 2019. This far exceeds the average annual growth rate of 12% between uh, 2015 and 2020. Uh, this chart shows the latest data up to the first quarter of this year. The, the wine import increased again, which is very unusual. Uh, normally, the first quarter import is not bigger than uh, the fourth quarter because um, importers have leftover wines to sell from the previous year. However, this year we saw another up in the first quarter, and this clearly indicates that wine consumption is fast growing in Korea. According to a news article in early March this year, uh, Lotte Mart, one of the leading hypermarkets in Korea, had 98% up of wine sales this year compared to the same period last year. So why is this happening? Uh, based on a survey performed in September last year, uh, people are consuming mostly beer and soju. Uh, however, consumers answered that they will likely drink more wines in the future. This is highly related with health concerns. Consumers are looking for lower alcohol drinks, such as beer and wine. And the pandemic also led more wine consumption as people choose wine as a beverage to drink at home. Uh, people who already enjoyed wine before now uh, opt for better, more expensive wines. So it seems the future of wine market in Korea yeah, seems quite bright. But there are challenges as well. Um, first, the high tax for wine in Korea. As you can see on this chart, we, we have very complicated tax system. If you import a wine of invoice value $10, the total cost becomes around $15 after adding all the taxes. And by adding distribution cost and sales margin, the final wine price could be around $20. Well, $10 becoming uh, $20 could sound like a small markup, but if a wine's invoice value is $100, then the total cost becomes over $150. And the final price could be nearly $200. So in Korean market, expensive wine gets more expensive due to this tax system. Uh, the second challenge is that no alcoholic drinks are allowed to be sold online. Uh, fortunately, smart ordering system has been granted last year. Uh, it is a system that allows consumers to order wine via online, but still they have to visit offline shops to pay and pick up the wine. Now, let's see how Australian wines are doing in Korean market. This chart shows that uh, Australia takes the sixth place both in volume and value. However, the thing is that this rank has never changed. Australia has always been in sixth place since 2008. Um, let's compare the number of Australia with USA. The difference of volume is very big, uh, is not very big, but the difference between value is huge. So why is this happening? First, 
it is necessary to understand Korean consumers. Though Korean market is still on its early stage, consumer states are getting sophisticated and they are seeking for diversity. Uh, this chart shows the, uh, the share of red wine is decreasing while sparkling wine has grown fast. In addition, consumers are trying new styles and uh, varieties from more diverse origins. The total wine imports from minor countries like Argentina, South Africa, Germany, and New Zealand had 35% up by value and 26% up by volume last year. However, still Australian wine export is too much focused on Shiraz. Well, I interviewed three major wine importers in Korea. They are strong players in the market, importing Penfolds, Brown Brothers, Yalumba, Henshiki, and so on. The common thing they said was that Australian wines are sandwiched between US and Chile. Uh, US wines are expanding their share from luxury and premium to popular and value wines. On the contrary, on the contrary uh, Chilean wines are spreading upwards to premium and luxury wines. The importer said that most Australian wines sold in Korean market are between $20 and $39 price range. They said consumers um, treat Australian wines as a small brother of US wines, only second to California wines. And they don't realize that Australia produces high quality luxury wines like cut wines in the US. So what kind of efforts have been done by uh, competitors? They do grand tasting and master classes regional basis. There is no US wine grand tasting, but California wine tasting, Washington State Wine Seminar, and for Italy, they are doing Chianti classical tastings, and Asti is doing master classes. So all separately hosted by, re, uh, by regional associations. They do this because they want to clearly communicate the characteristics of their wines and promote the diversity. Uh, they also host special wine events and uh, competitions. Uh, French Ministry of Agriculture has hosted Korea Sommelier competition every year since 2001. This event was held even in this pandemic uh, period. Um, they invite Korean journalists for on-site press tours. And uh, recently, US government and the Washington State Wine Commissions allocated a special budget to release a series of articles about their wines. Uh, 12 articles were published for US wines for six months, and six articles for uh, Washington wines, uh, including four wine seminars and Instagram campaigns. Well, I was one of the team members, and I also wrote you know, some of the articles. Uh, in case of uh, individual wineries, the owners and winemakers are visiting Korea very often. They tend to meet wine writers, opinion leaders, and connoisseurs face to face. Due to the pandemic, they invite us to video conferences now, but as soon as the COVID is over, they will come to Korea again. So finally, what are the key things to do to be successful in Korean market? Uh, Wine Australia is holding grant tasting and masterclass once a year in Korea, but uh, I think this is not enough. More grant tasting and masterclasses are needed and uh, they are better to be done regional basis. Uh, target oriented marketing is essential. Um, recently, uh, Darenberg has done a promotional event inviting active SNS influ influencers uh, well, actually the wine was not that popular in Korean market, but after the event, the importer have seen good increase in sales now. Uh, for premium and luxury wines, the target could be sommeliers, wine writers, connoisseurs, and uh, promoting premium wines are important uh, because they improve the, uh, the brand image of Australian wines, and at the same time, uh, has very positive effects on value wine sales as well. Finally, more face-to-face -face meetings are required. Some of uh, uh, some 
I can see some uh, large scale producers uh, let one sales director to manage all of their wines. Um, this could be an easy way to do the marketing, but um, may look insincere. Uh, people love to meet owners and wine, ma wine makers in person, and this makes them loyal to the brand and willingly promote the wines. Uh, all the traveling is restricted these days. You can just uh, start it now using the video conferences. So this is end of my presentation and thanks for listening. Fantastic. Thank you, Sangmi. That was great. Um, yeah, some, some, yeah, great summary of the opportunity and the, the challenges there. That was brilliant. Um, now, the last of our speakers is um, addressing India, one of the trickier environments, um, and that's Sneha Rayo. Uh, but Sneha is joining us from Sydney today. Um, now, Sneha has a really a very solid wine background and career. She worked as a winemaker for Big Banyan Wines, one of the biggest and one of the leading producers in India. Was the business head for Chrisma Estates, where she launched India's first super premium wine into the local market while also exporting consignments to the USA. Sneha has also worked as a brand ambassador for wines. She's explored all other facets of the business, including marketing, selling, importing, and exporting. With a wide breadth of experience uh, in our panel, Sneha has worked with both Australian and Italian winemakers, having completed harvests in India and Italy. She's also worked as a brand manager and ambassador in Australia for single malt whiskies. Thank you and welcome Sneha. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Mark. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here on this panel and talk about uh, the Indian wine market and the potential that still remains untapped. Um, so India as a country, as most of you all are aware, is very diverse. We have diversity in culture, cuisine, food, color, as well as our preferences for alcohol. Um, it is predominantly a whiskey or spirit drinking country, but wines is a growing segment that remains untapped. Uh, in terms of the Indian wine market, uh, it's estimated to be valued at about 150 million US dollars. Imported wines account for 30% and the rest is catered for domestically. The Indian wine market, domestic market is about 20, 22 years old and produces uh, a fair amount of uh, wines. Um, in 2018, analysts uh, reported that the Indian wine market had achieved a compound annual growth rate of more than 25% from 2011 to 2018 in its uh, report. Between 2010 and 2017, the Indian wine industry recorded uh, another double-digit uh, uh, growth of 14%, making the wine segment the fastest growing alcohol beverage uh, in India. Uh, Wine Intelligence released a report in 2018 where it likened India to where the Chinese market was 15 years ago. So that is the potential that remains untapped. India's population above drinking age is about 485 million, which is over a third of the country's total population. And this appears to be experiencing a shift that is normalizing a drinking culture, especially in the metropolis. The Indian wine market uh, is quite different from the rest of the markets. Um, we'll first touch base on the point legal drinking age. Um, India is a sleeping giant when it comes to its potential of its wine market. Uh, India's regulations about alcohol are subject to a state list, which effectively means the laws change from state to state. So um, the rules can vary widely from alcohol consumption, being prohibited to even the legal age you're allowed to drink. According to the Wine Intelligence Report, most of the wine consumption takes place in the metropolis. So Mumbai accounts for about 32%. Delhi accounts for 25% of wine consumption. Bangalore is a close third with 20%. And uh, Pune is 5%, Hyderabad being 3%. And finally, the state of Goa, which is the holiday capital, accounts for about 8% of the total wine uh, consumption. 
Now, um, in terms of the market, India is traditionally known to have a male dominated drinking population who favor spirits, beer uh, over wines. However, wine, even though it's perceived to be more suited for the feminine taste, is being accepted among the upper and the middle class populations. Um, and this is this perception is changing very fast. Rapid urbanization, changing lifestyles, rising disposable incomes, um, exposure to new and Western cultures, as well as having a large number of foreign tourists visiting India has increased uh, the overall wine consumption. Wines, so with regards to the drinking style in India, India, even though it's a warmer climate country, um, there is a strong uh, fascination and a drinking culture around red wines, which is a preferred uh, style of wine over white or sparkling. Coming close to the red wines is a segment called the fortified wines, which are similar to the Madeiras or the Marcella. Uh, so these are wine to which alcohol is added, and this is usually consumed in the three and the four tier cities, whereas the tier one and tier two cities tend to consume a lot of uh, domestic and imported bottled wines. Um, in terms of uh, the market, uh, what is the key important factors influencing purchase? The main important thing is price, which was covered by Stuart as well earlier. India is a very price conscious uh, market. What is unique about India is unlike Australia, India is a very regulated market. So there is a maximum retail price that is dictated for every bottle that is sold. So price remains the primary driver for wine choice for consumers, followed by brand familiarity. Um, Although consumers are price sensitive, they are willing to spend more on wines, especially for professional and family events to impress guests, etc. Now, growth is um, predominantly in the age group and gender, which is an important aspect as well. So growth is driven by the youth, which are in the age of 20 to 35 that consume a lot more wine, as well as in terms of gender, women tend to drink more wine, uh, while men prefer drinking whiskeys or scotch or other spirit. Um, wine consumption is also being driven by health benefits. Um, there is this whole vibe and hype around uh, drinking red wine being healthy um, because of which red wine consumption as well is a lot higher. Um, now, in terms of wine consumption and sale, predominantly uh, the touch points are hospitality and retail shops. Hospitality includes your hotels, uh, restaurants, clubs, and cafes, which all hold a license to sell alcohol. Whereas with retail shops, they are your, your standalone bottle shops, uh, such as your porters, liquor, et cetera, or modern trade outlets, which are similar to your dance, but not as big. Um, so this is just a quick summary chart to show you uh, how the industry um, in terms of the still wine consumption is over the years you could see from 2017 to 2019 the still wine consumption has only continued to grow uh, with uh, predominantly red wines being the segment that is consumed a lot more now before we get into understanding the export market just a little touch point on the domestic indian wine market now india has um, in terms of development of its industry, we have about 123,000 acres of vineyards, out of which only 2% is used to produce grapes that make wines. The remaining are all for table grapes. There are around 110 wineries in India. 72 of them are in the state of Maharashtra, where Mumbai is. Uh, wine production in India is spread across five major regions. Um, it includes Nasik and Pune in the Mahara in Maharashtra state, as well as Bangalore, Hampi and Bijapur in Karnataka. Um, these are some of the most popular brands. Uh, we do have a lot of um, uh, international brands as well that have, for example, Shandon that has set up a Shandon India label producing sparkling wines um, and tapping in on that segment, which is still being explored. Uh, you have Fratelli, which has tie-ups with Italian winemakers, um, as well as Steven Spurrier, they have a label with him. Um, Sula is an, one of the uh, second largest, it's the largest winery at the moment and the second winery that was set up uh, many years ago. Now, if you look at India's wine import by region, you would see that, um, 
The top destinations for wine imports, this is based on a 2018-19 IWSR report as well. Uh, the top destinations are Australia is our first largest importer with 41% of the total import, uh, um, uh, imported wines. Uh, European Union can, is about a close 33% and the rest um, is um, smaller quantities. Now, even in the Australian wines, if you, these are some of the popular brands that uh, most people are familiar with or consume or buy for everyday drinking, uh, gifting, so forth. Now, understanding the Indian market, there are many, multiple factors uh, or challenges in the Indian market. Um, so the first one is political. Um, India consists of 29 states, seven union territories. Each of these states are like a country of its own. They levy different taxes, fees, uh, duties, et cetera. So uh, why, because of this widely different regimes, um, um, it means you're operating in almost 29 different countries. Um, the demographic in India, because of the population, with the overall population numbers are about 1.2 billion. And this is growing at about 15 to 20 million every year. Of this, the legal age, as I mentioned before, is 485 million, which is one third that remains untapped. Uh, there are also a few other market factors that uh, you could consider. Uh, example uh, would be, say, the changing restaurant scene in Delhi. Uh, there is it's supporting uh, with an increased number of Italian restaurants uh, being established in Delhi. There is an increased demand for Italian wines. So also um, in Bangalore, where there are more Japanese restaurants being open, and hence sake is being uh, consumed a lot more. So this is also another factor that influences wine consumption. But uh, the long-term drivers, now the market is driven principally by the growing middle class. In the majority cities of Mumbai, New Delhi, Gurgaon, Bangalore, Goa, Pune, etc. This is being reinforced by the increasing take-up of wine in tier two and tier three cities, as well as a lot more women who consume wine, and it's acceptable now for women to consume wine. The cultural taboo is slowly being lifted. In terms of the outlook, uh, while yes, the in industry around the world is impacted by COVID, the market will pick up again once economic growth resumes and uh, the positive con uh, consumer sentiments. Hey, uh, um, yeah. Sorry, can I just interrupt? Your um, unfortunately, your audio is really quite terrible. So, um, oh. although, hang on, now you sound a bit better. Try that again. Is this better? Much better. Thank you. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Let me kind of start. I, I just looked it up earlier. Go for, please continue. All right. So let's uh, continue with the current situation. So the current situation in India, uh, wine imports have been seeing a double digit increase since 2019. Um, it was 14% in 2018. Uh, despite unfavorable domestic tax structure, Indian wine imports have been growing at 12 to 13%. Imported wines constitute about 35% of the country's total wine consumption in terms of value, uh, but only 12% in terms of volume. Now, most of um, India, most of the world's wine producing regions are available in India, but in very small quantities. Uh, local production is also increasing. Uh, we have about 17.6 million liters produced in 2019, but the number is still very, very insignificant compared to uh, the drinking population of 485 million. Now, import wine will be in high, imported wine will be in high demand and the number of Indian importers has also been constantly increasing in the last five years. Now, um, going on to my last slide. So the tips for success. Now, yes, India is a daunting market. It's not as easy as uh, most other markets would be, but it is a market that has a lot of potential that you could tap. So the way to go around with the Indian market is um, one, uh, we start off with point one. So as in the case of any market entry, extensive knowledge of the local situation is vital. As every Indian state has its own set of regulations and taxes, make sure that you are up to date with all of them or you understand the pricing so that you know how your wines will be priced once it lands in that respective market. Uh, distribution can be a major problem. So it's best to work with companies that have a lot of experience and have a well-established distribution network. 
Now, um, given the complexity of domestic excise licensing, etc., the key to accessing the Indian market is to identify uh, an experienced importer distributor or a wine producer who would like to import wines that complement their domestic wine production. Uh, it is also important to focus on developing uh, development in urban areas, as mentioned, Delhi, Mumbai, Bangalore, etc. Um, it's important as well to make sure that you have wines at all price ranges, as India is still a very price sensitive market. Commercial wines uh, tend to sell a lot more than premium in terms of volumes. Um, red wines and fortified wines dominate the market and more sales come in the about the seven to $15 range, uh, while the 15 to $25 range is now gaining traction. More and more wine clubs are emerging in India, um, especially in urban areas. So make sure you pay attention to them uh, so that uh, you could use these wine clubs for marketing. Uh, another key important aspect, uh, be patient try to invest in your relationship with your importer. Uh, as most of Indian wine importers have limited resources, you will have to get involved and help them as much as you can, starting with say promotional materials, samples, and also periodic visits. A major marketing issue is, uh, in India is the fact that regular advertisements for alcoholic drinks in mass media is not allowed. So you will have to use alternate methods uh, such as events, tastings, sporting events, uh, surrogate advertisements, uh, such as sponsoring festivals, um, it's, it's something that could be explored. Uh, social media is also a great, still largely unregulated channel for marketing your products. If, if keeping these in mind, um, I'd like to finish off my uh, presentation, which is summarizing the route to India find a good imported distributor, focus on the metros. And I understand, yes, with COVID looming, uh, probability of Win Expo, which is already finalized for the 9th of uh, 11th of December in New Delhi may be um, uh, rescheduled, but at the moment it's still confirmed. So this is something that uh, you could look at through Aust uh, Wine Australia uh, and see if you could have your um, products present, uh, presented there. If you need any help and assistance, feel free, let me know. I'm happy to talk about the market and offer any assistance. Thank you for your time and over to you, Mark. Brilliant, thank you, Sneha. So we've got a, one of the more pertinent questions that's come through for you in particular is yes. your reading of the situation with respect to import duties and tariffs and things like that. One of the things that's that India is not, notorious for, it, its complexity and its high taxes, What's what's the latest on when you know that might start to the, the, the Titanic might start to turn around there? <laughs> I wish I had an answer for that, but there are talks um, because each state has its own levies now. Uh, the government of India levies 150% import duty, which is still being discussed by um, um, to, to lower this, as well as there are import duties levied by each state. Um, these regulatory affairs and policies will take a lot more time uh, to, um, to make the market more fruitful for importing wines or spirits to India. But at the moment, uh, there is no immediate respite, but yes, talks are in progress. And I think Stuart can add more value on what Australia's negotiations with India is at the moment. Slow burn, yeah. Now, for everybody, we only have a few minutes left, so we will need to be quick. Can I just maybe draw everybody's attention again to the poll that we've had running? Please take a moment to have a look at that and see if we can fill that one in. Um, maybe before we hand back to Tom to wrap up, um, we're a bit lean on time for questions. Stuart, just to wrap up and bring it together for SMEs who might be turning over, let's say, five to 25 million sort of winery my business size, where to from here? What what are the sort of top three things that small houses need to do just to make a start, at least start building some groundwork while we can't travel? Okay, uh, I think there's some, there's some things you can do quite quickly. There's firstly, make sure you're claiming all the right export grants at the moment. So ensure that you're claiming the EMDG grant, the Export Marketing Development Grant. Take a look at the state grants available uh, Wine Australia has had an export grant as well. So there's, there's quite a bit of money sitting out there to help exporters get onto the export diversification pathway. 
and also to help you when you're actually um, trying to export. So there's that piece. So check out the grant structure. Also, do your research. Which which are the markets that are growing the, the easiest and the, and the best? Some markets are obviously uh, growing exceptionally well, such as South Korea, but a lot of exporters are also targeting those markets as well. Uh, markets such as India um, is a really hard one. Um, and that is probably a generational piece of work that the Australian government needs to do. Um, free trade agreement isn't in place. Um, that will probably take another 10 years to play through. So, um, but there's still business to be done. And normally the, the Indian market is a really strong market for Australia. Um, but during this current 12 months, it, it's, it's weakened. So do your homework, check out the available grants. There's a lot of capability support, um, support out there at the moment through Austrade, but also through the state associations and the state trade bodies as well. Uh, great advice. Thanks, Stuart. Um, look, I, I do wish we had a, a bit more time for a few more questions, but we've really got to wrap it up here. So feel free to get in contact um, with follow-ups and I might just hand over to Tom to wrap up for us today. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, I think I'll give everybody uh, an overview of how the poll results uh, turned out. In terms of the top three Asian markets that our participants are looking at, Japan and South Korea are one of the two of the top three. So hopefully you've got found some new insights based on the presentations today. And Vietnam is a popular choice. So perhaps next day we'll, we'll, uh, we'll discuss that particular market. And in terms of the other issues that you're facing at the moment, COVID-19 recovery is the uh, top issue, branding reputation and shift to online sales channel is another issue that our participants are dealing with. Uh, that brings us to the end of today's session. Uh, thanks, Mark, for moderating today's webinar. Thank you to Stuart, Sanmi, Sneha, and Makoto for your fantastic presentations and insights.